I wanted to go domestic policy first. Here is President Obama speaking to the legacy of LBJ. And he talks about there's been this debate of government really fixing problems, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, and the role of government. And then he goes into his defense for big government. Here is our president earlier this week. Roll it. Today, we remain locked in the same great debate about equality and opportunity and the role of government in ensuring each. As was true 50 years ago, there are those who dismiss the great society as a failed experiment and an encroachment on liberty, who argue the government has become the true source of all that ails us and that poverty is due to the moral failings of those who suffer from it. There are also those who argue, John, that nothing's changed. That racism is so embedded in our DNA that there's no use trying politics. The game is rigged. In a time when cynicism is too often passed off as wisdom, it's perhaps easy to conclude that there are limits to change that we are trapped by our own history, and politics is a fool's errand. And we'd be better off if we rolled back big chunks of LBJ's legacy, or at least if we don't put too much of our hope, invest too much of our hope in our government. I reject such thinking. Professor, he, he obviously rejects such thinking. He's celebrating the Civil Rights Act, LBJ signing that and commemorating that. And I'm thinking to myself, interesting what, is, what civil rights has become and what are now being defined as rights. Your thoughts. Well, the civil rights movement, which, let's remember, was a movement grounded mainly in the church, in the black church in the South, not urban northern liberals, um, achieved its fame and then very quickly degenerated for various reasons, a lot having to do with the 60s, into the civil rights industry. And the civil rights industry is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Democratic Party. We have set up this really dysfunctional feedback loop in which the Democrats deliver the pork through social welfare spending, etc., government spending, entitlement spending, and get the support of the self-selected so-called black leaders, right, who claim to represent all of uh, some 30 million black people. And then each one benefits from this relationship. But who loses in this relationship? Well, who's lost is a some third or perhaps at least, I think, of those black people who are being left out of the chance to uh, succeed, uh, to take advantage of economic growth, et cetera, because they are more useful for this industry when they are kept in that um, dysfunctional culture because that provides them a moral, pseudo-moral, I should say, argument for more money. So that a um, somebody like most of the cabinet of Obama who are black come from affluent or upper or middle class backgrounds, and they can say, well, you know, look at this endemic racism that's keeping these poor people you know, in this position, and that's been a very, very destructive, destructive uh, feedback loop, and obviously, particularly for, you know, the people that they're supposed 
help, but they can't turn loose of that narrative. It's, and we saw this with Eric Holder just yesterday, going and saying he's been mistreated more than any other attorney general because of his race, already forgetting that this not a decade ago when the uh, Hispanic attorney general was savage, much worse than he has ever been. And you can see that dynamic at work there. Here's a man of privilege, highly educated, not from the ghetto, not from any of the traditional, you know, circumstances of, of typical black Americans, claiming that he is like them, a victim. It's like when Obama spouted off about Trayvon Martin and said, if I had a son, he would look like Trayvon Martin. I mean, this has gotten so egregious now that one wonders just how, how long can this continue to go on? Have they jumped the shark yet? Well, to me, they did it. Right, for so many of us, I, they they have. I mean, Al Sharpton... Exactly. Uh, there are, there are so, so many sharks jumping in the air right now. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you another example. I just saw some video on the news of Obama speaking on the same platform as Al Sharpton. This is a demagogue. This is a man who is a confirmed liar, a man who has blood on his hands and crown heights that he should be given a spot, even on a failing uh, cable news network like MSNBC, which nobody watches. But to be on the same stage with the President of the United States, that that is just astonishing. And that we, most of us in America, don't feel that as a grotesque, um, you know, um, it, it, that's what astonishes me. It seems that if someone were pushing a policy, let's say, let's go to economics, and pushing a policy that would put more black teenagers out of work, they could, with this kind of administration and the way they lash out, and I would say the Democrats, including Nancy Pelosi, obviously, and others, willing to make things up, talk about the use of the end bomb being used in a situation where they had video everywhere and Andrew Breitbart challenged that right. because we all object to it and and they couldn't find it they make reckless accusations but raising the minimum wage puts more people out of work in particular it hurts minorities and studies have shown at a greater degree and I, I, we don't like play color games or any of that. We're Americans without hyphens. But if a conservative, well, wouldn't be doing it, but if somebody with an R by their name or that happened to be white pushing this policy, they could be accused of racism, couldn't they? No question, no question. In fact, I often think that if you could imagine this demonically intelligent, uh, head of the Ku Klux Klan 50 years ago on the passage of the Civil Rights Act, saying, you know what, we're not going to use violence anymore. We're going to help support a culture that will lead to um, more black young men being killed by other black men in one year than were lynched in the whole history of lynching. That's a fact. We will destroy the black, black family by, by uh, supporting the sexual license of the 60s, the feel-good, do it, the um, ideology and the politics of the uh, studies departments and universities that uh, institutionalize the notion of black victimhood, and then make them dependent on the federal government, all supported by white people who live far, far away from them in a completely different world and have no intention whatsoever ever having anything to do with them, then you could achieve that racist aim by all that's happened in the last 50 years. Why would they have to lynch black people when they're killing each other? When more black babies are aborted in New York than are born in a year. If yeah. they wanted to genocide, the way to do it is with how race has evolved in the race industry today. It's a slow motion uh, genocide, just to benefit, just to benefit some so-called elite black leaders and activists and the Democratic Party. 
we point this out because, quite frankly, they can't talk about anything else but racism. And so we're going to address some of these things merely to point out what the reality is and the impact of policies. We go to statism and dependence, and you referenced in your article regarding poverty, studies in the late 1960s, quote, established without question, welfare changes behavior. It leads to the behavioral changes that keep people in a state of poverty and dependency. I think this was from your 2012 piece, by the way. So why have these programs, you ask, after the quoting, so why have these programs continue to expand and new ones like Obamacare continue to be created? That's a great question, Professor. Yeah. And so we know the politics of this is to divide and only hear something, go with a false narrative and divide. But at some point, people feel the reality of those policies over time and they feel the reality is the truth of those policies, either being out of work or dependent upon the state. So I look at what's going on now with the constant pressing and the even more of a knee-jerk reaction, if you could have one, to everything being racist or discriminatory as the end of liberalism as we know it because it's collapsing. There's no more way that you can't push it down the road anymore. Am I wrong? No. Uh, and what what you have is grievance politics, which mm -hmm. which is created by identity politics. That is, once you say that if people are in some essential way different from other people because of their race and, more important, because of their history of oppression, then grievance has to be leveraged for some form of reward. Uh, jobs, government jobs, affirmative action programs, um, you know, welfare, whatever. But the the logic of grievance politics is you can never say, okay, the grievance has been paid back or uh, everything's been corrected, so now we can all just be the same. You can't do that because you've already institutionalized it. There are jobs, uh, there are rewards, there are people benefiting. So you have to keep manufacturing grievance, and that's the, behind the whole racist charge. The racist charge is not about people really believing that there are... I knew, I'm old enough to have known old school racists, believe me. There, there might be some of them around today, but they're minuscule. Right? That's why they had to invent things like institutional racism. That's why this Justice Department wants to uh, prosecute discrimination charges not on the basis of an intent to discriminate, but simply on statistical disparity, which is lunatic, because there's all sorts of reasons why you might have statistical disparity in home ownership or whatever. Because they know they cannot prove old-fashioned racist intent. So they redefine the term. And this is the most important tactic, uh, because... This keeps the grievance going. You have to keep the grievance going. If there are no grievances, then you invent grievances. You manufacture grievances because the grievance is the engine of the power, the political uh, power. And it all depends on the existence of a social welfare federal leviathan that isn't just benefiting that constituency. It's got everybody implicated in it. And that's... That's the real insidious, uh, destructive effects of this huge multi trillion dollar institutionalized machine for handing out taxpayer money to various groups for various reasons. And that's why that's really, if we, we boil everything down, we got to get to doing something about that. In doing something about that, it's about freedom, and it's also about communication and the ability to articulate that point of view and challenge the insult that, and the false premise. And we rarely get that because we have an establishment, which is part of the so-called conservative party, which would be the Republican Party, listening to the advice of people that want to, in essence, destroy conservatism because it is the threat to their power structure as well as the establishments. So 
then you have people who stand up, Alan West and 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 Ted Cruz, mm -hmm. Trey Gowdy, demanding justice. I'm not just speaking racially here. Let me tell you something. Professor, I'm sure you're like me. I don't like talking about race. I think it's a ridiculous conversation. I don't like talking about the hate squad of the Westboro morons and the KKK and the, and the Black Panthers. It's the, you know, it's the idiot box for me there. And same thing with homosexual marriage. I don't like talking about it, but they're trying to change the definition of it, and they're trying to deny gender and, quite frankly, advance an agenda that I believe is harmful. That all said... When we are confronted with it, they want us to talk about those things and be on the defense. And then when people are standing up, they say that person is totally unelectable. Should mm -hmm. that tell us something <laughs> about those people? I mean, well, the fact, what was Reagan considered? Was he ever considered electable by the left? He wasn't considered electable by Republicans for de a decade at least. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it took the complete, you know, uh, Incompetence of Jimmy Carter to finally, you know, for his moment to come and the economy to get to the point. That's what, you know, if you put Reagan could not get the nomination before that. 20 years later, he couldn't get the nomination today, being exactly the same person. I know a lot of Republicans don't believe that, they want to hear that. But, you know, we have two, our political class may be divided by Republican and Democrat, but at many levels, not all levels, but at many levels, they share certain fundamental assumptions. And one is that the federal government of this size and the social welfare entitlement spending, which is on track to devour the whole federal budget, is here to stay. And what the most Republicans can claim that they want to do is slow down the rate of growth. Right? Slow right. down the rate of growth. And that's, that's the problem. Uh, Nicholas Eberstadt, in his great book I recommend called The uh, Nation of Takers, federal government has grown 8% more under Republican administrations than under Democrat administrations. You know, you look back yet, Richard Nixon gave us the EPA, which is one of the absolute worst, worst, most intrusive, destructive to our economy government agencies. They are costing us trillions of dollars in economic growth and jobs. Uh, Ronald Reagan, I admire Ronald Reagan as much as anybody, but he gave us legislation that lowered Social Security disability mm -hmm. criteria that has led now to this huge, huge numbers of working-age young people and others on Social Security disability insurance. And in 2016, that program is going to be bankrupt, which means the money to fund it is going to have to come from the general fund. So both sides are, have, have agreed... They have agreed, and many Americans have agreed that this is what we want. So that that's the level at which they may argue about how much debt, or they may have uh, legitimate foreign policy arguments. I think that's where you see some legitimate um, you know, distance between the two parties. But in terms of our d domestic uh, politics, in terms of the size of the federal government, only those people you mentioned, right? Yes. I was the one saying, no, no, this isn't about slowing the rate of increase down by two points so we go broke in, you know, 70 years instead of 50 years. It's about seriously stopping it and, and figuring out a way to start this undoing this to some degree. And that's, that's really the big, big problem and the hard task. And I don't think there's many people that, that really have the stomach for that fight. And as the foundation for this, it's about pushing the individual out, pushing God out, because that recognition is about c accountability and not relying on the state. It's about bringing it back to what our founders understood. You wrote recently about not recognizing human nature. To close out our conversation, yep. go ahead, Professor. No, you're absolutely right. That any tyrant, whether it's an individual or it's a, a, a government, wants to eliminate the mediating institutions between the people and them. Religion and God is one of the, was, used to be, one of the most important mediating institutions. The family was a mediating institution. Private business is a mediating institution. They want to seize control of those. They want to eliminate those. They want to marginalize it as they have marginalized faith. 
anything that challenges their authority and power, right? Because right. that is an alternative. And then it's what we've been witnessing since ever since, you know, the, the New Deal. And to learn more about that, I, I was reading your stats. I mean, you, a number of articles that you could literally put into the book of another book that you've written. I know you've written about the Europe's condition, and I look forward yeah. to reading that at some point. But I'm going to post some of that information because on the disability stats and, and the lowering of the standard when it came to welfare reform and pointing right. that out, th th this is all, it's a quickening, and you've outlined it. Professor, there's just not enough time, but we appreciate you, man. Great to talk with you. Thank Take you, care. Frank. Thank you, sir. Happy Easter to you and your ha listeners. Happy Easter to you, sir. Thank you. Bruce Thornton, research fellow at the Hoover Institution. As we close, thank you. Go to the Facebook page, like the page. You may not like me, but I think you'll like the content and enjoy and go back and forth. When you comment, just be specific of it and, well, comment and have fun. Live with honor your life, compassion your heart. Always keep the faith. Always keep the faith in Jesus Christ. God knows you, loves you. He created you. Have a great weekend. God bless.